appreciate their faith in the Lord. Thank you all for being here this morning. One of the statements Jesus challenged his disciples with was this. If you have faith as a grain of mustard seed. And then he went on to talk about what you could do with a little bit of faith. He went on to talk about the fact that you could say to this tree be removed. Or to this mountain be removed and be cast into the sea. In other words, a little bit of faith can go a long way. But it was because that's the beginning of some great things that will start happening when you start with a little bit of faith. Now, don't keep a little bit, but, but starting with a little bit, you can grow a great big faith and do great things with it. So I want us to, this morning to examine ourselves. How large is your faith now versus when you began How large is your faith? We had a good class this morning about the fact that you can't do anything unless you stay attached to Jesus. Of course, staying attached to Jesus means you're drawing your energy. He's the resource from which you keep developing and growing. And and so you've got to keep your faith intact. Faith is something that's pretty easy to acquire on the logical level. On the logical level, I cannot imagine that the world started itself. Cannot imagine that the world and the universe that we live in was just a product of a blast from who knows what. And then here we are. And life began out of something that would have eliminated any possibility of life. A blast. (laughs) How do you get life from all of that? And then you got... The idea of life developing itself and and evolving, I I just don't believe that. I don't believe that life evolved by some chance. In fact, it would take a lot more faith on my part to believe that than it would be to believe that the creator of the universe created us in his image. It would take a lot of faith for me to believe that some original life had everything that it needed to keep going and to reproduce itself and keep evolving. It would take a lot of faith on my part. I don't have as much faith as a skeptic or an atheist. I don't have that much faith. It would take a lot of faith to believe that. Whereas it's logical and it's easy to believe. In fact, it'd be, there's no excuse, Paul says. For not believing in the creator of the universe. Creator is the life source. You can't keep tracing life and then come to a standstill and say there was no life at one point and then it started. You had to have an eternal life source. And of course when you start saying eternal then you, you're, you're talking about God again. You, it's just really logically impossible for me to believe anything other than that we are created by God. An all-powerful, all-wise God. But then you've got to go a step further. Well, who is he? Is he Allah? Is he Buddha? Uh, who is he? And, of course, it's not too hard to recognize that the creator of the universe had some dealings with this nation called Israel. And even though he used them as a stubborn people... He had a plan to bring a Savior for everybody. And that plan was described in many, many prophecies, types, and shadows. And when you look at the Bible material from Israel alone, it's easy for you to see that that wasn't a collection of books that uh, made them look good. It made them look terrible. It was a collection of books that pointed them and everybody else to the need for a Savior. And his name was known as Jesus. Logically, and looking at the historical information, looking at all the information that we gathered, I find it quite easy then to believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. In fact, I don't think it's logical. It would be logical for me to believe anything else than that. I cannot believe that Allah is the same God. He's not. I do not believe 
that Buddha is, uh, holds a candle to the God that created the universe, revealed his plan through a stubborn people like Israel, and then presented Jesus Christ to us. Now, to me, that's very logical. It's a faith that starts really small, but it's logical, and it, it just seems to me that once you get started digging into that material, that it's like we said in the class this morning, you begin to do the things that you didn't think you could do before because now you have faith in someone outside yourself. I don't have a lot of faith in myself, but I have a lot of faith in Jesus. And that's what we all need to have. But now how large is that? And that's the thing that we've got to examine every day. And I hope you're examining yourself as we all must do that. But looking here in the book of Hebrews, here's a, here's a group of people who started doubting whether they should keep going on as Christians, as followers of Jesus Christ, because now they've entered into a period of persecution that has, over a period of time, worn them down. They are just now worn down because of opposition. There's family problems that exist because if you believe in Jesus Christ and part of your family doesn't, that begins to wear you down. And then if your family is ridiculing you all the time and speaking evil of you because you've committed to this man, Jesus Christ, who was crucified incidentally in a humiliating way, and then you believe in that person as the Messiah, you're going to have to be committed to that. You're going to have to be committed to that in a very trying way. In other words, people are not going to they're not going to celebrate your faith. They're not going to help you in your faith. That is, people of the world, they don't understand this. But you do. You understand this. You have faith in Jesus Christ. Well, looking in chapter 10 of Hebrews, I want you to notice a few things that the writer, who I believe to be Paul, says that uh, here's what you've got to do with this little bit of faith that you have. And I want it to be stronger than it ever was. Look at verse, for example, verse 39. He says, but, but we are not of those who draw back to perdition. I mean, where is that going to take you? You remember when the disciples of Jesus one by one left the scene and all that was left with was the 12 apostles. And Jesus said, will you also go away? And then... Peter said, where will we go? You have the words of eternal life. And so that little germ of faith, that little bit of faith, kept them hanging on when others left. And the Hebrew writer says, we're not like everybody else. We're not like those who draw back to perdition. But we are of those who believe to the saving of the soul. That is, we're going to believe and we're going to keep believing until it finally gets us into the presence of the Almighty Himself. That is, when I put down this body of flesh, this tabernacle, the spirit and the faith that that spirit contained is going to be in the presence of God. It's appointed unto man once to die, and after this... What are you going to take with you? Well, you're going to take a faith with you if you had it. And your faith is going to have to be the thing that sustains you through the difficulties and the trials. You're, and you must not allow your faith to be so weak that you're easily drawn away and distracted and pulled away from the faith. He says, we're not that way. In verse 35 of chapter 10, he says, Therefore do not cast away your confidence, you started out confidently. Is there any reason for you to have lost your confidence? Well, maybe people might disappoint you. The Lord didn't. And so don't cast away your confidence in Him. And that confidence has great reward. Your labors are not in vain in the Lord. It has great reward attached to it. And so do not, in the rest of this journey you're taking here, do not cast that confidence away. 
Verse 36, he says, you have need of endurance. Put some durability behind your faith. I mean, let it be something that's tested all right, but you do not lose your confidence in the Lord. In all that Paul went through, he would say, I know who I believe, and I'm persuaded that he's able to keep that which I've committed to him against that day. What day? Any day of testing and trial, and especially the day that I have to put off this tabernacle, and I know it's coming. So you need to be able to be a, have a lasting faith. But you don't just automatically have a lasting faith. It just doesn't happen. You have to feed it and you have to build it. You have to nurture it. You have to exercise it. But if you do that, then some of the things that you deal with, the problems and the issues and the challenges of life, are either going to make you or they're going to break you. Your faith has got to be the the enduring kind of faith. And I'm not, I hope I'm not just preaching words that you're letting just go right over your head because I want your heart to capture this. You need to have a durable kind of faith. You have need of that kind of faith. You have need of endurance so that after you have done the will of God, you may receive the promise. So what I want us to do in this lesson is look at Hebrews chapter 11. And I want you to keep in mind that the promises of the great Messiah, the blessings that were to come, these people in the Old Testament only hoped for those things, those advantages, and now you have them. Now the thing is, they did a whole lot of great things with less to work with than you have. You got a whole lot more to work with than they had. And yet with a little bit of faith and developing that faith, they did great things, and his challenge to these Christians is... You must not allow yourself to go backward instead of forward. In this lesson this morning, I want us to understand these three things. You can do more than you think with faith that's not in yourself, but faith that is in Jesus Christ. You can do more than you think. Second of all, People have done great things under lesser systems. That is, before Christ got here and gave us all of these spiritual advantages, people did great things under a lesser system. And the challenge that Paul is making to the brethren there and now, incidentally, would be if they could do that then, under a lesser system, what's our excuse? People have done great things under a lesser system. And here's one of the things that that, uh, John claimed in 1 John. He says, faith is the victory that overcomes the world. And he was talking to brethren who were discouraged, who were disheartened, who forgot about what their faith was about. And he says, you can overcome the world. You can become a a victorious person, not because of your own strength, but because of the strength that supplies your faith. And you utilize that supply for your faith. If you don't utilize it, of course, you may not understand what we're talking about. But let's look. In Hebrews chapter 11, starting with verse 1, he explains faith. He explains the nature of it in verse 1. Now, faith is the substance of things hoped for. It means I've got some reason for it, and it gives me great confidence that what I'm hoping for later on is actually going to be there. I'm not talking about pie in the sky, by and by kind of 
just wishful thinking, but we're talking about confident expectation of this because there's some substance to the faith that we're talking about. And it's not faith in some kind of fairy tale. It is some faith because there's substance to it. It is the confident assurance that what we hope for is going to happen. We know the man that was here, and we know the man that went there, and we know the man that came from there to here and went back. And there's substance to that. And because we know he was here and that he was raised from the dead, we know this life is not all there is. And we know that we're not accidents. We know that there is life on the other side. It's substantive faith. It's not empty faith. It's faith with some reality attached to it. It's attached to the reality of God's involvement with Israel and all the prophecies and types and shadows and the fulfillment of that in Jesus Christ. And therefore, there's some reasons for our faith. Peter says you better be ready to give a reason for your faith because faith is not blind It's reasonable. Confident assurance. Don't cast away your confidence. And then the second part of that, it is the evidence of things that we do not see now. The apostles would talk about the fact that we have seen him. We have handled him. And so we know it's real. We also saw him leave the earth So we know that he's real. It's evidence. Faith is evidence. That is, it becomes the evident. It became evident in the apostles, did it not? It became evident that the things that we can't see with our physical eye, we know are real. It's the evidence of things that we cannot see now. Paul would talk about what he went through in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, the many different things he did. And he did this because he could see the things that you do not see with the physical eye. He knew they were real. The evidence of the things that are real are carried on from heart to heart, passed along to us. The necessity of it is described in verse 3 and verse 6. By faith we understand. We understand some things. What do we understand? By faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God. In other words, it was no accident. God put it in motion and he put it into place. And by faith we understand that whether people of the world understand that or not. We understand that. We understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God so that the things which are seen, the things you can see with your eyes, the trees, the world, the universe, we understand that they were made of things or not made of things that are visible. What does that get us back to? God. Now look at verse 6. Now without this faith, without faith in God, it's impossible to please Him. So you've got to have a faith that makes it possible to start pleasing Him. For he who comes to God must believe that He is. And there's a second part to that. You not only must believe that God is, your only alternative is we got here by accident. But you not only must believe that He is, but you must also believe that He is a rewarder of those who diligently seek Him. So diligently seeking Him is crucial. So you move from a faith that believes in the reality of God to a a faith that moves you to start seeking God and God says, I will reward you then. You will find me. Do you know where we find him? 
We find him in Israel's history. We find him in Jesus Christ. We find him in the Bible. We find him in nature itself. All the things that are made are made by him. Now, let's now examine our faith. Do you have the foundation that you believe that he is? And second of all, do you believe you ought to seek for him and find him? Grope for him if necessary? Now, here are, some, here are 16 examples of people. People of faith who not only believe that God is, but they did something with that and they began to seek God. Sixteen examples of faith are listed here in Hebrews chapter 11. Now, what we find in these examples is that these particular individuals exercised their faith and under a lesser opportunity than yours, they exercised their faith, they knew God and they started doing God's will. What are some of the things that they did? Well, verse 4 mentions one, By faith Abel offered to God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain. In other words, Abel didn't look around and say, I wonder what Cain's going to offer, and then just try to match what everybody else was doing. No. See, if you're going to seek God, you're going to have to do what God says. You're going to have to give God your best. And giving God your best is seeking what is according to God's will. And so by faith, Abel offered to God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, through which he obtained witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gifts. And through it, he being dead still speaks. His influence lives on. And it tells us, well, then you need to give offerings to God that, that you can prove are acceptable to God. You don't do like Cain and just offer anything and say God accepts anything and everything. You have faith that God wants you to offer something in particular, something that you can prove is acceptable to the Lord. Other things that they did, like Noah in verse 7 By faith, Noah, being divinely warned of things not yet seen, never seen a flood. Yet God's word said there was going to be a flood. And so he took that information and he says, well, I believe there's going to be a flood. God said so. He didn't look around and say, well, what do all the scientists believe? I mean, do they believe that there's going to be a worldwide flood? Probably if he'd asked anybody that was around in that day, do you believe there's going to be a worldwide flood? Probably every one of them would say, no, we've never had that. That's, that's never happened. It's not going to happen. But what Noah had was the Word of God. And the Word of God told him there was going to be one. And so you build this huge barge, this ark. And Noah, because he believed God, just went ahead against all odds that people would, were giving him. He said, well, I, I believe God. I believe God. And so I'm going to keep building this boat. And he built it. And it took 120 years. But he built it. He worked daily. He worked regularly. He worked hard. He used the information God gave him. The wisdom that God gave him. And he built this huge barge because he believed the information from God was right. In 120 years, he had no reason to lose his confidence in the promise of God. No reason to. Have you got a good reason to lose your confidence in what the Lord has said? I haven't found a good reason. So he built this because he was a man of faith. And he exercised that faith even after maybe he could go 20 years. Maybe I I dreamed that was what God said. Maybe it wasn't like it was. Maybe it just seemed real. Maybe it wasn't. But I am feeling pretty foolish because nobody else believes it. You see, after a while you might start to doubt your resources. But he didn't. 
He didn't doubt the source of his faith was God and his word. And God didn't have to keep confirming it 120 times, 120 years. God said it one time, and I believe it. Verse 17 and 18. Here's Abraham by faith when he was tested. Do you love me more than your child is the test. Abraham, when he was, all the promises were that through Isaac the seed is going to come. And now you're asking me to go against that promise and kill the very son that you said is going to be the seed line through which the great blessing is going to come. When he was tested, he offered up Isaac, and he who received the promises offered up his only begotten son. Did he have it figured out? Well, of whom it was said, in Isaac your seed shall be called, but here's how he figured it out. He was accounting that God was able to raise him up, even from the dead, from which he also received him in a figurative sense. What is that saying? Well, that says that he exercised his faith in God's ability, even when it did not seem reasonable to fit that with the, with the statement that everything is going to come through Isaac, and then you tell me to kill him. And his faith in God's word was so solid that he said, well, I... God's not going to go back on his promise. God's word is going to hold uh, hold firm. God's able to raise him up. And then Moses' parents defied the king of Egypt in verse 23. By faith, Moses, when he was born, was hidden. Who was hiding him by faith? His parents. Moses was hidden three months by his parents because they were exercising faith. Because they saw he was a beautiful child and they were not afraid of the king's command. They're not afraid of it in the sense that they're just going to give up their son very easily. By faith... Moses, when he had the access to all the treasures of Egypt. And God said, I want you to take my people out of here. Moses did not sit back and say, but you know what? I can stay here and be comfortable a while. By faith, it says... Verse 24, that he refused to be the call, the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the passing pleasures of sin. I've got an option. I can engage sin, it's passing, I'll die. What will I have in the end? Nothing. Or I can suffer with the people of God and really have the true riches. And so he made his choice. Verse 27. By faith he forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king. For he endured as as seeing him who is invisible. Because I know God is invisible, but I know he's there. And I can see him with the eyes of my understanding. Rahab took great risks. And the summary in verse 33 is this. That these people, through faith, subdued kingdoms. They worked righteousness. They obtained promises. Stopped the mouths of lions. They quenched the violence of fire. They escaped the edge of the sword. And out of weakness were made strong, became valiant in battle, turned to flight the armies of the aliens. Women received their dead, raised to life again. And others were tortured, 
not accepting deliverance, that they might obtain a better resurrection. You see the quality, the durability of that kind of faith? The summary here is, this is what they did under a lesser system that did not have all the spiritual advantages that you now have in Jesus Christ. Here are the things that they endured. They endured terrible torture. Have you been tortured? Some of them were tortured. They had that kind of faith that said, I think it's worth it to be tortured. Ridiculed? Have you ever been ridiculed because you believe in Jesus Christ? We will be. Some of them were suffering cruel flogging, whipping and beatings, thrown in prison unjustly, stoning. Have anybody thrown rocks at you because of your faith? Some of them were sawn in two. Can you imagine that? Somebody cutting you in two pieces. We may face that. Beheadings. Those kind of things where people even today have their heads cut off because of their faith in Jesus Christ. Death by the sword. Extreme poverty. And here I'm challenging us to look at the situation we're in today and say, is my faith strong enough? Is it large enough? Have I been using the resources to develop that kind of faith? Can I endure those things with the better advantages that I have in Christ. Here's why they endured it. Verse 30. uh, Well, let's drop back to verse 10. Verse 10. He waited for the city which has foundations. That would be something that's really permanent. Something that you can count on. He waited for it. Whose builder and maker is God. Look at verse 13 through 15. These all died in faith not having received the promises. That is those promises that came in Christ Jesus. But having seen them afar off were assured of them. Had no reason to doubt them. They embraced them as true and said, it doesn't matter what happens now. Those things I can count on. They embraced them and they confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. We're just passing through here anyway. It's a temporary life anyway. On the other side, though, is something permanent. Look at verse 16. The end of verse 16 says... For he, was pre- uh, for he has prepared a city for them. And they believed it. And in verse 26, he looked to the reward. In verse 35, as we saw, that they might obtain a better resurrection. In other words, they counted it all joy. They endured for these reasons. They saw by faith the invisible city of God. It's not pie in the sky by and by wishful thinking. It's guaranteed. They saw it by faith and they knew it. They valued it more than anything in the world. We can give up some things. We can miss out on some things here. But we cannot allow ourselves... To miss out on that world that is to come. They looked forward to their own resurrection. And they lived with substance in their faith. That says, I'm not giving up. I can give up a lot of other things. But I'm not giving up my faith in Jesus Christ. We've seen valiant heroes of faith in our own time, haven't we? When life 
was in the balance. We've seen somebody holding a gun to somebody and say, do you believe in God? And they would say yes. you believe in Jesus? And they would say yes. And then they were shot. That's the kind of faith that I'm, in, uh, I'm hoping that I will have. I hope you will have it. Because that's the only kind of faith that's worth having. If, we, if our faith is not that large and is not that strong, and really we don't know until the challenge comes, don't we? but we do know that while the challenge is not yet here, we do know this. We better be getting it ready. Because those who live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. And if we can't handle the smaller things, how could we handle the bigger things? If we, if we have run with the footmen and they weird us, how could we contend with horses, Jeremiah said. In other words, if the challenge was bigger than it was before, and we're not prepared for the smaller ones, that we can't even be durable in our faith now that's not even tested very hard. Maybe the only test is, can you be faithful? And we're not managing that. What I'm asking us all to do is take a look inside. Is your faith a Hebrews 11 kind of faith? Where you not only can use their examples, but you can take all the spiritual treasures of wisdom and knowledge that are provided for you in Jesus Christ. You can use those things to pump your faith full of substance. And use that kind of faith for any kind of challenge in this life. How large is your faith? Is it pumped full of substance? Is it a Philippians 4.13 kind of faith where, where we tell ourselves because we actually believe it. That I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Do we believe that? You can have confidence, but don't lose your confidence. You can build an enduring faith, but you've got to supply it with substance. Put some stuff in there, and those things that the Lord has provided will, will carry you through. Well, that's enough. You got the point, I hope. Everybody has the point. I hope everybody's been listening. I appreciate that kind of attention. Now, you realize life is temporary. Choices must be made, and we must make them now. We can't put these kinds of choices off on the back burner. These are things we've got to supply our faith with now. And if you've never obeyed the gospel of Jesus Christ, now is the time to obey the gospel of Jesus Christ from your heart, from your own conviction that Jesus is the Christ. Confess him and be baptized into him this morning if you've never done so. If you've done that and fallen away and you see you have not supplied your faith with substance and you want to turn that around, we can help you. Please come.